Welcome, Ellen and Anya. Hello. Good evening Hello. and welcome. Bienvenidos, friends of the Hispanic Society to Las Tertulias de Arte Hispano, or Hispanic Art Gatherings. I would like to thank our members who have joined us monthly and welcome to all of those who are new members and new friends of the museum and watching their first tertulia. We continue these conversations on the first Tuesday of each month at 6 p.m. If you're not a member yet, please do consider joining by going to our website, hispanicsociety.org and search, search for membership under support. This evening, I had the pleasure to introduce Anya Andreva. She's a, she's a Russian born emigre who is a textile conservator and a scholar of Hispanic culture. Ms. Andreva rece received her master's degree in fashion and textile studies from the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City. She currently works as a textile conservator at the Textile Conservation Lab at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City with projects ranging from 16th century ecclesiastic embroideries to Sheila Hicks modern fiber installations. Ms. Andriva's passion is the examination, research, and conservation of Hispanic textiles. In the course of the fellowship, Ms. Andreva has been primarily working with Mantones de Manila while reviewing other textiles in the collection. She has initiated and implemented an update in the textile storage system and participated in basic registration and cataloging. Ms. Andriva has been collaborating with the head of conservation department at the Hispanic Society, which is myself, and curators, Dr. Noemi Espinosa and Dr. Marcus Burke. This presentation will offer an overview of the origins and development of the Mantones de Manila. The main focus will be on the objects in the collection of the Hispanic Society and the discoveries made during their examination. Some of the questions and directions, directions for further research will also be discussed. Please, Anya, feel free to start your presentation. Okay, thank you so much. So first of all, I would like to thank the Rockefeller Brothers Fund for giving me the amazing opportunity to explore the textile collection at the Hispanic Society. It really was a dream. My deepest gratitude is to the museum staff, especially Alain for hosting me, guiding me and supporting my research and sharing her uh, space with me. In September, when I began my fellowship here, the Mantones were going out on loan. And what began as an examination and coordination, um, condition report writing for three shawls evolved into a research project. So this presentation is a chance to show the Mantones at the museum's in the museum's collection. Um, the first part is a brief overview of the Manton history. As many questions still remain to be answered, this is far from a complete narrative. The second part, we will look at the objects and let them speak for themselves. So looking closely at these embroidered silks while I was examining them, I was really taken by the beauty and the exquisite craftsmanship. It became a dream to have full view, high resolution photographs taken of each shawl, making them digitally available for viewing. Photographing the Mantones was a real undertaking since most of them are very large. Patrick Lanigan is the photographer who made this dream come true. And to him go all the credits for full and quarter view images of the Mantones. The close-ups and micrographs are all mine. So here we'll now share this. So the Manton de Manila. One second. Here we go. Uh, this is my definition uh, of the Manton de Manila. It is a square silk textile, usually selvage to selvage, embroidered with silk yarn and sometimes floss, edged with a silk fringe that is knotted to various degrees of complexity, also known as piano shawl. Extant examples are mostly from the 19th and early 20th century. Here's the Manton in action. We have Soroya Sevilla, the dance from a series vision of Spain on the left. Next to it is a photo of a flamenco dancer dated March of this year. In both images, the Manton is dancing. In Soroya's work, it completely covers the dancer's body, becoming almost one with it. It is as if the Manton with its burst of colors and flowers and unbridled movement of a fringe reveals the essence of the dancer. In the image on the right, it itself has become the dance partner with movement of its own. 
These colorful shawls are generally associated with Spain, not only with its flamenco culture, but current fashion as well. And here we have a, um, a clip from a 1963 remake of La Verbena de la Paloma. And he, while watching, it's very short, I invite you to pay attention to the body language of the woman. <laughs> Well, she told him. So this is something to keep in mind as we go through the presentation. That clip um, is going to be important. So why Manton de Manila? What does this have to do with Manila? Manila, that the name refers to the Manila Galleon, which was the Spanish ship that sailed between Manila in the Philippines to Acapulco, Mexico from 1565 to 1815. To quote from William Schertz, to the people of Spanish America, they were the China ships or Manila Galleons that brought them cargoes of silk and spices and other precious merchandise of the East. To Spain, they were the link that bound the Philippines to her, and it was their comings and goings that gave some substance of reality to the Spanish dream of empire over the Pacific. From the manifest list of the galleons, the greater quantity and value of a cargo was silk in all stages of manufacture. Official quotas attempted to control who and how much could bring on board as cargo, but these quotas were never followed. Silk was easy to pack tightly, um, or tuck among personal belongings for that matter in hopes of successful trading in Mexico. The galleon operated under the Viceroyalty of New Spain and from the very beginning, the abundance and low prices of Chinese silks brought to the colonies by the galleon posed a severe competition to Seville's own silk exports. For that reason, numerous petitions were made to the king to close down the galleon operations throughout its existence. Um, it, that never happened, obviously, and uh, ironically, it's these embroidered Chinese shawls brought by the galleon that became one of Seville's uh, most recognizable fashion mascots, and this is the map of, uh, of the trade. So let's look at an earlier object to establish a connection um, between China and our Montones, um from the 19th and 20th centuries. So this is a silk embroidered panel from China. It is circa 14th century. I selected this object because it is similar in size and design arrangement to the much later 19th and 20th century shawls. And here I, let me see if I can point, yes, I can point the arrow. So note the distinctive circular movement, especially in the central motif. This is the phoenix and the dragon. It's quite ubiquitous. Uh, also the symmetry of the quadrants of a shawl, if you divided it into fours, at the same time, there is asymmetry in the individual elements. All of these, uh, design um, points will be repeated later in the Mantones. Over time, Chinese embroiderers began to adapt their visual vocabulary to the tastes of European and colonial consumers. While traditional Chinese designs employed motifs to convey ideas and not necessarily express the nature of an object, um, the Western approach was essentially decorative. So gradually images like dragons and toads uh, were dropped among others and Chinese flowers were sometimes replaced by European species or imaginary stylized motifs. Uh, at the time when Spain came um, into the market and began dominating it, uh, China was already trading with Portugal. This is a silk, it's an, um, a, a small portion of a silk of an embroidered panel from the 16th century that was um, made in China for the Portuguese market. And note already here the wider border, this is the border and the density of the design compared to the preceding panel. And this is a feature that develops over time more and more um, as part of the evolution under the, the pressure of the consumers, you could say. So denser design, larger flowers, um, and the symbolism changes. These are two 19th century examples that I found that uh, reflect sort of the end of that development. Many of these exact motifs are to be found in our Mantones. The galleon silk trade had a significant impact on colonial embroiderers as well. While some of the goods were repacked and sent out to Spain, a large amount remained in the market uh, in Acapulco and was dispersed in the colonies. Contemporary accounts state that everyone in Acapulco was clad in fancy silks from the servant to the Lord. 
Local textile artists were quickly absorbing new styles, mixing indigenous European and Asian sensibilities and craftsmanship. This late 18th century reboso in the museum's collection is a good representative of this development. There is, um, this is actually where more research is needed to establish the influence of a colonial community artist on the Manton fashion and styles later. So now we turn to fashion history for a little bit. Spanish influence on European fashion diminished by the 17th century and France took the lead, which continued well into the 20th. Um, in Europe, the shawl became a significant accessory at the end of the 18th century. Mostly the shawls were rectangular, at least um, in the beginning, later shifting to a square shape. And here um, you have a whole um, a lineup from the, well, from the 30s into the late 50s. So by the 1820s, the shawl was part of any elegant outfit. Subsequent increase in skirt widths, as you can see here, and the crinoline of the 1850s made wearing coats impossible. So large shawls, sometimes folded on the diagonal, became indispensable. By the end of 1860s, however, shawl fashion began to decline, ebbing away by the end of the century. Um, now we turn to Spain. So the long 19th century was turbulent for Spain, to say the least, uh, leading to a search for national identity. Fashion-wise, this meant establishing a national costume that was distinct from the French influence. From the late 1700s, the machismo movement fueled that shift, the acceptance by the all classes of the lower class fancy dress as authentically Spanish. For the upper classes, it was, however, reserved for masquerades and portraiture. And this is an example we have um, in the museum's collection, the Duchess of Alba in the Maja costume. From the 19th uh, century, the Maja dress was largely replaced by the Gitana or the gypsy dress with its flamenco connections. Development of a Gitana dress is attributed to a blend of Maja dress with contemporary fashionable day wear of the 1820s and 30s, which was um, French in essence. After 1850s, the Gitana dress expressly included the Manton de Manila. Thus, while general shawl fashion in Europe subsided, the manton remained as part of the Spanish national costume worn for special occasions. Recall the image of the woman that we saw in the 1963 film. And if you remember, she has the Maha stance and she has the manton, so that's the result. That's the national symbol. There's also um, a theory that I've encountered um, that the manton fashion originated with the cigarreras. Um, Sometimes it's called the sort of the origin myth, um, but I will go into it because it, it also has some, some consequences for us. These were women who went to work in the tobacco processing factories in Andalusia starting in 1813 um, when men who worked there originally went to war. A manton was a, or a small manton sometimes was a distinct element of their dress. Some sources state that the tobacco came rolled in brightly colored silk from Asia, in Manila, which the women used to decorate their shawls with. And here we have a, a photograph, it's in 1906, so it's a later photograph of the ladies, um, the cigarreras, and they're wearing the shawls. Um, it is plausible that um, if this was not, you know, even if this was not the birth of the Manton fashion itself, but of a style, and there is a cigarrera style of a Manton, as we shall see later. While the national dress was Andalusian in its essence, it became the image of Spain to the outsiders who in turn reinforced it often with embellishments. And possibly the most famous example of this, um, sorry, here we are, uh, is Prospera Merimes Carmen in 1845. Although Carmen, a gypsy cigarera, is hardly representative of the mainstream working women of Spain, she served as an exoticized and eroticized for that matter, version of them and Spain herself. So here we're back to the uh, Carmen image. So here also in the collection, we have this beautiful uh, artistic rendition. It is a late 1920s, so 1925 and 27, representation of the Maja and Gitana archetypes. Um, this representation well documents, documents the return of the Manton to the fashion scene in the 1920s as an exotic Spanish shawl. And here we have um, 
So I, I was doing uh, research. I was um, actually looking at the fashion magazines in Spain, um, La Moda Elegante for one, which was really for the elegant woman and her family, and there was no manton to be found. So essentially the manton remains to be sort of a garment worn by the, or associated with the, as from the beginning with the majas, with the lower classes. But here it becomes this exotic Spanish shawl. And uh, the Gazette du Bonton, which is the image on the left, which was a leading fashion publication, states next to this image, shawl, the discovery of which we owe to Spain. Even though the shawl had been worn in and known in Europe and worn 100 years before, this feels like a rediscovery now. On the right is an image from Vogue in 1926. And again, we see that this is uh, the Manton is associated with, uh, with Spain. So now, um, by uh, also by now, the Manton came to represent the greater Hispanic culture, especially that of a popular class, like I mentioned. And this is from uh, 1921, the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse movie. The scene is a tango bar in a famous Boca district in Buenos Aires. So it's kind of a seedy bar. Hollywood offers a valuable summary of the exotic and bohemian image of the Hispanic culture of the time. This is, um, just to keep in mind, this is an anti-war movie. And one of the messages is how the common people across the Atlantic get dragged into a European war. And the Manton, if you think about it, it's a rich, beautifully, um, extensively embellished textile. It's a lot of work hours. It's beautiful, colorful silk. It still represents the lower classes. And I think that's just fascinating. So let's play this and watch the Manton dance. <laughs> Okay. Oops. Okay. Um, I do really love the movie, especially where the woman makes the jump and you see the fringe flying up and down with her. Uh, so now uh, we turn to the Manton construction and we will look at the Mantones in the collection. So the ground is a word faced plain weave. It's uh, crepe, sometimes it's satin, usually selvage to selvage. It is all sewn and embroidered by hand. The hem is turned to the reverse. Uh, it's turned double for the, on the raw edge. And um, the, there, sometimes it's, it has a running stitch holding it together or it's just held in place by fringe insertions. The fringe yarn is inserted in groups. Um, sometimes it's an eighth to a quarter inch apart. There's much more grouped uh, around the corners to make the turn. And the knotted, the macrame size varies from one inch to eight or 10 inches. And it's very diverse um, in, uh, the, in the complexity of macrame. The embroidery is layered or it's called the encroaching satin stitch, which came from China. Other stitches are used for minor elements. Um, so these, I, I found a few interesting um, things about the embroideries that I wanted to share. They're somewhat random, but they all relate to the Manton. So in China, silk embroidery was traditionally done by women, where there are both sides of the embroidered textile, um, where both sides of the embroidered textile look uh, like the face, or we call them the double-sided. Uh, two embroiderers would have been working, one on each side, passing the needle back and forth. In China, in the middle of the 19th century, a strong export market encouraged the development of different regional styles of embroidery. Previously, it was North and South. Guangdong or Canton had been historically the hub of silk production for the Manila Galleon and for the export market. Here, most of the embroiderers were men and their work is said to have been less delicate compared to women's work in other places. This comes from a Chinese source. In the absence of exact provenance, knowing the regional styles can actually help us identify the origin of the objects in the collection, especially when provenance um, and records are missing. So there are several Manton styles. I'm not listing all of them, but these are um, those that I could find several sources to confirm them. One is Chinescos, the other Cigarreras. We, we saw that previously. Another is Isabelino. And mixed is my term for things that are um, yet to be identified. So here's the Chinesco style. It is the one that is um, the least changed from the original Chinese um, embroidered textiles. It often includes people, pagodas, the landscape. 
And here, uh, this is a pagoda with people, which is a frequent motif in Montones. Here is our one of the Montones, uh, Montones in the collection. It is the double-faced Monton with ivory faces. And you see on the right is the scene uh, that is very similar to what we have just seen. Here it is in comparison. Uh, we have the original textile, the panel, then the Monton scene and Zuluaga's Carmen dancing, and you can see how the elements are almost identical uh, with the women, the pagodas, the trees even. So this, uh, one of the interesting features on this monton are the ivory faces. Now ivory just by itself was one of the items um, exported via the Manila galleon. I have not yet found records for where, or was it a same workshop or different one that where they were putting these on. However, I did see that the brush used to paint the faces on the, on the ivory was a single bristle brush. It was very fine work. Interestingly, the faces are embroidered on both sides under the ivory. On the right, uh, I just included this picture of animals to show you that there is the split st stitch uh, technique and just the meticulous execution of uh, shapes of the animals. So this is a short conservation story. When I was looking at the Monton, something interesting um, appeared, uh, or I was noticing something odd. On the one side, or rather on, the, on one corner, there was a lot of loss of black embroidery yarn right here. The, um, almost all of the butterflies were missing their antenna. On the other side, there was a cigarette burn and many stains, while on the other side they were, you know, far but few, fewer, just just a few stains. And I thought that this could potentially point to the way the shawl was worn. That if the wearer had it folded on the diagonal, and this part, the top one, was to the body, when the black yarn silk was rubbing against her clothing it would have been wearing off a black um, and brown dyes, uh, yarn and silk usually deteriorates faster because of the iron oxides that are used in the more denting. The outside, however, is would have been exposed to all the elements and her surrounding and recalling that tango scene bar. Just for instance, here we have a cigarette burn, we have soiling, so things may have been spilled on this mountain. So it's interesting, the object can indicate sometimes the environment that it was used in. Um, Elena and I had a discussion about doing conservation on this monton to reconstruct the black antenna. And we thought that uh, aesthetically, these were accents that were necessary. So here you have the picture before and after uh, when we've, we've replaced the antenna. So this is the cigarera style. It is distinct by its large, huge, oversized flowers. So it is possible that the cigareras who were using those bright colored textiles were using them to embellish their existing shawls. This is a Isabelino style. It's called so for Queen Isabel II of Spain, and she's said to have worn these. Here we have a mixed uh, style. It employs both large flowers and medium-sized flowers and Chinese motifs. Here it is enlarged. This is continuing with the mixed style. This happens to be my favorite monton. It's very densely embroidered, beautiful, um, very meticulously executed embroidery. Uh, there's a lot of static and dynamic um, counterplay. Let's, for instance, the corner uh, motifs of flowers are symmetrical, but then you have the talking birds, as I've called them, they are asymmetrical. Several motifs are arranged in clockwise or counterclockwise manner. So there was a lot of um, just a very dynamic piece. And this is it close up. Uh, the length of stitch is under an eighth of an inch here, and there are up to six um, color shade changes for each petal or for some of the larger petals. On the right, I included some of the embellishment in embroidery for the feathers of a bird's tail. Another dis um, interesting feature is the color theme. So we have monochromatic, uh, dichromatic, and polychromatic montones. And this is the monochromatic. In the collection of the museum, there are several white ones as well as a black one, very similar. 
Uh, the dichromatic uh, or dichromatic, this is a cigarera style, if you can see by the large flowers there. I know this is a lens favorite. So we have a polychromatic, and we've seen many polychromatic. Um, Antonis, this one, however, was interesting. It has this half and half design. It's a, a Chinesco and Cigarera blend, first of all. But then uh, we have a lower border that includes people and the top border that only includes flowers. And the whole Manton is separated really into pagoda with people and only floral um, top part. I wasn't sure why that was until I saw a performance recently at the, um, where the singer, the flamenco singer was wearing a manton folded in half, not on a diagonal, but crosswise. And I believe possibly this manton was intended to be worn a certain way like that. One second. So here, um, Here's a detail from this manton. It has, oh, sorry, it has the peacock with very interesting tail. It is a polychrome. So this is a polychrome manton with polychrome yarn in the tail. And the way this was done, it's double plied. So two colors were plied together and then plied again or twisted together with another pair um, of colors, resulting in this um, really. This, this three colored yarn that was used to embroider the tail. There are some new motifs that appear and I wonder if I'm blocking um, the text, sorry. Here we are. So the new motifs among others are pineapples and wheat. Pineapples, uh, I thought it was a very interesting inclusion. It's definitely not, it's not Chinese. It comes from Latin America and sometime around the 16th century, it made its way to Europe and was praised for its uh, exoticism and its beauty. In the, in the beginning, it was called the king of fruit, but by 19th century, it became feminized and began to be called the queen of fruit. And it was associated often with prosperity and hospitality. So here we have two mantones with, um, with pineapples. The fringe and the macrame section. So it varies from manton to manton. And I believe there is a timeline where they, they start growing. The, we, we can have some, some of the mantones have just simple knotting, various length. Then we, it gets more complex, like the example in the middle. And other times it's um, something that's very complex and very dense, like the example on the right. This was something I decided to include at the end. These are some of the peculiarities that um, I observed when doing the examination. So sometimes you have this exuberant, um, elaborate and perfect embroidery of layers as you have on the left. And sometimes I'm not sure if this was a forgotten petal. There's a small thread that seems to be indicating the color that this was supposed to be, but this uh, marked out embroidery, you know, this pattern was never embroidered. There is no sign of um, either silk yarn or any holes made in the textile. Also with the fringe, sometimes you have a perfectly um, tight twist, uh, tightly twisted silk, which is the example on the left. And sometimes you have the over twisted craped uh, yarn that looks like the example on the extreme right. Just uh, some of the, the range of techniques that one encounters when looking at these. And uh, at the very end of putting together this presentation, I realized that um, this, this strange, interesting similarity. So on the right, we have our Chinese um, 14th century silk. And here's the tail of the dragon or the phoenix here. And then the dancer from this March, this year's March performance, um, the manton seems to be interestingly repeating the same shape. I just thought that was curious. So in conclusion, um, the close examination and photography have enhanced my recognition of the mantonis as a category of wearable art. Scientific analysis such as dye and metal testing would be the next step to deepen our understanding. Using the data collected from all of this, we could identify technique and style groups of these shawls, place them on a timeline, fill in gaps in the narrative and expand our vision of the global artistic community. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Anya, uh, for this wonderful uh, presentation. I have a couple of uh, questions uh, for you. But uh, first, uh, I would like to show um, to the public um, the Manton de Manila that I own, because uh, actually it is, uh, I, I love Mantones de Manila, but uh, as a Spaniard, if you, if you are a proper Spaniard, you need to have a Manton de Manila. So this is, uh, this is the one that I have, uh, ma made in, in, uh, made in, in, Seville, in Seville. You can see, the, you, can see you can also see the fringes. And, um, and what is very interesting about, uh, I think about the Mantones de Manila is that uh, this tradition is still alive in Spain and most of the regions, uh, they adopted uh, the, this tradition. Uh, even funny enough, uh, I'm from Galicia and uh, uh, part, part, uh, part of a, uh, a certain area of Galicia adopted the Mantones de Manila. You go to Madrid and they use uh, Mantones. You go to the, to the north and, and they use man Mantones. And uh, I do have another two examples here that uh, that's the question that I want to ask is uh, the influence in Latin America. And uh, if you could uh, maybe explain a little the, the, the difference between, uh, between the Mantones de Manila or, or, or the Rebozos uh, between Manton de Manila that uh, is made in Spain and the Rebozo that is, uh, is made in Mexico. For example, I have here another two examples. Mm -hmm. uh, as you can see, the macrame is, uh, is really big. But this is, uh, this is an example of a, of a Rebozo. Yes. And I have a, when I went to Mexico, I got crazy and I had to buy them. And this, for example, I mean, this, this example is just beautiful. I mean, all the, you see. It's silk. It looks, it appears to be they silk. Are, they, they, yes, they are, they are silk. So this, this will be, this will be my, my first question. Uh, the influence of the, the Mantones de Manila in Latin America. And then the second, my second question as a conservator, I would like to know if you had the chance to analyze some of the dyes or this, or if this is a, a project uh, that you will do in the future. Certainly. Okay, so with the first question, and uh, I'm glad you asked. I hope uh, other people or you know, viewers were wondering where is the portion about Latin America? Because I did mention that there was the artistic influence and a lot was going on so in the artistic community. So first off, I will say I was finding um, sources uh, that do state that there was large migration of craftsmen from the 16th century. A lot of Chinese embroiderers were resettling both in Manila and in Mexico. And uh, it was there was movement backwards also. Uh, Manila, however, I will say uh, right away that I have, I'm still exploring the sources. I realized that I did not see any extant objects um, and I would need to dig deeper and I would like to encounter them much like I did these ones um, because my research is object oriented. And so I, I do need to see the object or at least several sources corroborating its existence. Now silk um, is very perishable. And so objects, you know, we do have um, a lot of them surviving 19th, 20th century earlier, not so many. There's one at the v &A that is said to be the last quarter of the 18th century again maybe it's 1800 uh so it's a little it's a bit harder to find plus when silk is worn they are precious textiles so people would have been upcycling them you know cut them up use them for something else if they're not wearable uh when i began to see objects in the hispanic society's textile collection that come from latin america i saw a different style of embroidery mm -hmm. so i could not state um definitively yet that i can just repeat to saying that these mantones were fashionable there and because this really turned into a beginning of research um the latin america is my next portion that i would love to really think my research teeth into because there's so, so much to see and also we have so many objects here at the museum to build um to really build the continuity in objects that's really what i'm looking for uh so yes there are mentions and sources that are you know these other museums have stated that uh, Man the manton was in fashion and was worn in in latin america i have seen rebosos I have not seen mantones that would be like the mantones we have here. 
but that is to be uh, to be explored. And as for the second question, um, I do believe that the technical, um, you know, the dye analysis, metal thread, we do have one month on with metal threads. It would really be useful to establish the origins of the shawls, you know, to understand the production line. And we could gather a lot of information from it also comparatively. Um, and, you know, if other museums have this information, we could really expand the database of what we know about Mantonas, where they were made, who. Um, so yes, that is in the works. I have not been able to do that yet. I haven't had access to the, you know, to a scientific lab like this, but I do hope in the future. So. Yeah. And also, I mean, what I would like to say is that uh, nowadays you can buy, uh, in Spain, you can, you can buy a Manton de Manila and it can range from a hundred euros to 5,000 euros or 10,000 euros. It depends uh, the quality that, uh, that you want. And uh, I believe uh, they are still doing beautiful, uh, I mean, beautiful things. Uh, I wonder if uh, we have uh, any questions from the public? Laura? Yes, yes, we do. So the first question is if scientific methods would allow more accurate dating of the mantones. Well, that's a wonderful question. I do hope so. Um, number one, we've dyes um, for sure, you know, in mid 19th century, we start getting synthetic dyes. So if anything is prior to that, we will definitely know that it's not a, you know, we can tell within a decade, I would say, um, for sure. So yes, it would help. And it would, be very, it would be very useful because we lack provenance or dates on some of our of the objects in the collection. So yes, the metal threads also, again, um, we could look at extant objects in other collections or somewhere where the analysis has been done, compare that. Um, so yes, it would help. We have another question. Um, it is apart from the fact that the silk um, used to come from Manila via the Manila galleon, how else did Manila contribute to the development of the manton in Latin America and Spain? That's another, um, <laughs> this is another gray area so far because um, historically, well, you know, during, for the duration of the Manila galleon, Manila was really deprived of development of any industry because everything was so heavily um, in commerce. You know, people were going there, Spaniards were moving there, people from Latin America were moving there, and Manileños were involved in commerce. It was really like the gold rush only multiplied, I would say. Everything was about the coming and going of the galleon. So there were there were shops, there were embroidery shops, there was not silk production. They were um, really, they had abaca and uh, I believe some other fibers sort of from a local uh, plants, but silk never took off. It was, I believe, a dream at one point that, you know, um, the Spanish crown was hoping for, but that just never took off. So Manila for the duration of that time was really, um, it, was, it was a New York of its time, you know, for the Spanish embryo in that sense. It was all commerce. And unfortunately that undermined the local economy. So the silk was coming from China. Plus, Chinese silk was so cheap and so accessible, it just really killed the market, you know, for everyone else. Thank you, Anya. We have another question. Was the manton already in vogue in Manila before it became popular in other parts of the Spanish empire? Hmm. I'm not aware of it. You know, I would love to look into that. Again, the sources for Manila, uh, I have I would contact the museums in Manila, which I have not done yet, but in the general sources, I have not seen that mostly. Uh, the real fashion center is said to be Mexico, especially Acapulco, because this is where everything was really geared towards. But I, I would imagine they were wearing them. Again, it's... In looking at things, it's hard, it's hard to ignore the normal sort of ebb and flow of life. If people are handling these silks, so they would have been wearing them, but I could not give you um, an exact source or a picture uh, to confirm that. But just because human beings borrow from each other's fashions and when they're all engaged in this massive um, you know, galleon enterprise, 
um, I would imagine they were wearing, you know, they were aware of fashions, people were coming and going. So I, I would love to find those examples. Um, so I have one last question is what would be the earliest example of a manton de Manila in Spain? Hmm. In Spain, they began to be made at the end of the uh, 19th century. Um, so the galleon stopped operating um, in 1815 and then Mexico gained independence in 1821. So there was more of a direct, you know, um, shipment. And once, uh, you know, in the second half of 19th century, when the Manila uh, Manton became part of a national costume, local embroiderers started, you know, picking up the baton and embroidering and borrowing and also adding and changing the style of the embroidery. So you can tell the differences, you know, it's just a different sensibility, different artistic expression. It really kicked into gear though, early 20th century from what I've seen in several sources, really the production shifted. Until then it was just, you know, it was much cheaper to be taking them from China still. You okay then? It looks like we have one more question. Are the mantonas mentioned in wills as bequests to family members? Yes, we have some with provenance that were given to the museum by people who had inherited them. So yes, it was a, always a prized possession. Um, and some of them, you know, for people who would be immigrating, let's say to the States, this is one of the things one brings, you know, it's prized family possession, it's a memory of one's home country. So yes, the, I have not seen the wills, but I have seen the provenance that implies that it was uh, passed down from one generation to another. Um, so in terms of overall, all the products that were in that trade route, mm -hmm. which was the most sought after? Was it the mantones, ceramics, or furniture? It was silk. It was hands down silk. In all the, um, the bills of lading, Again, this is from sources. I have not looked at the bills of lading, but I've seen several sources, you know, corroborating this information. Silk was the number one commodity that was shipped. It was um, easiest to sell, highest in demand. It was much easier to transport, like, um, you know, the way they would get packed in China and repacked in Manila sometimes so tightly. And to avoid customs and inquiries about um, the weight or the nature of the product, they would sometimes put the worst silks on the outside and the really precious ones inside so that they could go over the quota for the price range. Um, and so it really was a silk craze, you could say. Silk was always number one in the cargo, in the cargo list. Thank you. Um, Ellen, I think that you can help us answer this question. Are the mantones shown in the presentation available for viewing in the museum? <laughs> well, uh, I, I mean, when, when, when we, yes, actually, uh, that's, what, uh, that's the next uh, idea that we have. Uh, we would like to organize, organize an exhibition. And uh, I think uh, it's a great idea to be, I mean, it's gonna be a great idea to be able to show it to the public because we, we have a, an extremely interesting uh, uh, collection of uh, mantones as uh, Kat, uh, Ania show uh, in the presentation. So I think that's gonna be the next, the next step. So <laughs> stay tuned. I, I have another question for you, um, Anya. Um, how, ma how many mantones do we have in total at the Hispanic Society? Do it's a have... lovely question, Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> so far, um, so there, there are more than we thought, I will say that. Right now we've accounted for 16 and we have about uh, 10 or 12 covered in, you know, with condition reporting with some more extent. However, I was looking uh, for more and a Apparently, there, there are more of these uh, monochromatic ones, especially white ones, uh, that were uh, collected around the tw in the 20s or 30s, I believe, you know, received into a museum. So there appear to be more. Uh, but I believe we have uncovered the bulk of them. So, and they do have different, um, sorry, just something to mention also. Um, one of, after seeing a few of them, uh, there was this one manton that looked very different. And, um, 
you know, as a conservative, at least I, I, you know, I trust my gut feeling to start an inquiry sometimes and everything felt very different about it. Uh, the ground was satin, not crepe, but that was kind of the obvious thing. There's something about the embroidery that was very, it was done professionally, the, you know, it, it really the same style, but there was a certain stiffness and awkwardness as if somebody who's a professional embroiderer is given this style, you know, these motifs to do, and it's not, it's not quite their natural, you know, um, thing, they're not quite used to them yet. So just in, in going back to the questions about the origins, you know, I could have this have been made somewhere else other than China, yes. Uh, again, looking at more objects offers that opportunity and also, you know, um, just by comparison. So I would say some could be singled out for this questionable origin. Just remember that there was this one um, rogue manton. But for the exhibition, uh, all of these questions really thank you so much for them. Uh, they do point to a need for further research in the area. So for, for the exhibition, I would hope we have more information on Latin America and the Manila input into the Manton fashion. Um, so Anya, we have one last question from the chat. If no one else from the audience has a question as we're ready to finish tonight. Um, the Mantila term is generally known. Is the term Manton an equivalent? The mantilla, well, mantilla is a, is a uh, I'm not sure, let me see if I understand this right. Mantilla is a different accessory than a manton. It, they're not interchangeable. Is that the question? Yes, I think it was the difference between yeah. mantilla they're, and a manton. So the mantilla is what you saw in the maja. Uh, you know, we have those examples here too. Manton, there's also, also um, Montan, I, I don't want to butcher up the name because I don't remember. There's a name for a smaller one. I just found it recently. It's a smaller shawl, but essentially it is a Manton and then there's a smaller Manton. It's, it's different from Mantilla. And the Riboso is, is a Riboso. It's a, it's a rectangle. It's a different type of accessory. So, uh, Anya, uh, thank you so much uh, for this wonderful and insightful presentation. And I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Um, I would also like to thank Rockefeller Brothers Fund for their support in launching our curatorial and conservation fellowship program, as well as the Queen Sophia Spanish Institute and Herbert and Muriel Goldsmith for their additional support. I will also I will also say, would like to say thank to all of you for joining tonight and say goodbye hasta la próxima on Tuesday July the 5th when curatorial and conservation fellow Orlando Hernandez will pre will present on Pancho Fierro. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>